Mr. Mr. Yeah. Pagan, um, wh how we what are we supposed to make of the fact that the government's position before 1998 appeared to be that of the petitioners, that either a circuit foreclosure test was sufficient to invoke the savings clause, or that there were constitutional problems with interpreting the savings clause otherwise. Then from 1998 to 2017, I think, if I've got it right, the government took the opposite view, the view of the amicus, that uh, the circuit foreclosure test, neither of those tests work, and that the savings clause should be measured about whether it's effective and adequate to raise the argument, that the baseline would be implicit in the text or explicit in the test, text. And now, for the first time, the government's coming up with a completely new theory that no circuit courts adopted and neither side in this litigation pursues. Well, what are we supposed to make of that? Well, Justice Gorsuch, uh, just I mean, it's a clever argument, but uh, you, the, the brief discusses it as the natural reading of the statute, but, but no circuit court over the last 50 years has read it that way. Well, Your Honor, I, I, um, I, I think the, you're correct that we've shifted positions. There's a, I think your chronology, in candor, we've shifted around a little bit more. Even more than said. I described. I've been yes, generous. I, I just, okay, to, to, to be completely Just candid, as I was generous to petitioners but, <laughs> about, uh, about court marshals, and apparently those are not permitted either, but okay. I just want to be completely I'm, upfront with the court about that. But uh, it, I think the bottom line, Your Honor, is the way we're interpreting it now is the way that the court actually interpreted it itself in Heyman and Sanders, and I think it's mirrored in Swain against Presley, which interpreted the analogous DC provision, and in Boumediene, which is that the saving clause essentially makes sure that federal prisoners weren't disadvantaged by the adoption of this new remedy. They weren't substantively disadvantaged or procedurally disadvantaged. And in doing so, it ensures that there aren't going to be any constitutional problems. We don't think there'd be any constitutional problems in these particular circumstances uh, under Felker against Turpin, but e even if there were, um, the easiest way to make sure there's no constitutional problems with the withdrawal of habeas is to keep a residue of habeas where they might inadvertently have missed something. And I'd like to That's, return to Justice yeah. Alito's question, which is, uh, you ask us to use the baseline of habeas as it existed between about 1948 and 1995 and ignore what happened after 1995 and before Brown, well, I guess 1953, though you do pluck a couple of cases before Brown. Um, how, it seems a, a, a bit of a, um, a bespoke reading of habeas. Uh, it, it would be, Your Honor, uh, but let me clarify, that is not actually our reading of habeas. We think that the, uh, you look to the federal habeas remedy now. And as I was trying to describe in response to Justice Alito, figuring out the contours of the federal habeas remedy now, you would look at traditional habeas, so things like Davis would tell you something. Should we look at before Brown, in which it was mostly jurisdictional? Uh, that habeas was limited to jurisdictional questions? Well, Your Honor, that I don't, our analysis, I don't should we think ignore that? I think you would look at federal habeas as it exists today, which would, in, which, to the extent the before Brown cases aren't kind of superseded by some of the later ones, that would be uh, that you could potentially look at them. But th we do think, and I just want to be very clear on this, we do think that it is informed, as this court has said, by the statutes that this court has enacted. And it can be informed by Section 2255, particularly in its provisions like 2255H or its statutes of, statute of limitations that are also mirrored in state habeas. Because that gives us a very clear indication that habeas as it stands today does not allow those kinds of claims, the kinds of constitutional and factual claims that I still think my friend the petitioner's approach um, might in theory allow. But one thing Congress did not speak to were the kind of statutory claims that you see in Davis that everyone agrees were available in traditional habeas. We don't have that kind of clear statement. And the kinds of claims we're talking about here are claims that someone is in prison potentially for the rest of his life for conduct that Congress itself, according to this court, never wanted to make criminal the, in 